You need us to mute ourselves? Yeah, um, please everyone mute yourselves, yes. Good afternoon and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Planetary Pause series. I'm Georgia Kelly, the Director of Praxis, and today we are most fortunate to have with us again Richard Heinberg, who has spoken at several Praxis events through the years, and we're really happy to have you here today, Richard, so welcome. I'm going to give you a proper introduction now. Um, the title of Richard's new book and the program today is Power limits and prospects for humanity. I put in the chat box the direct link at Reader's Books to order this book if you're local. And Richard Heinberg, as many of you know, is regarded as one of the world's foremost advocates for a shift away from current reliance on fossil fuel. He is a senior fellow at the Post Carbon Institute in Santa Rosa and is the author of 13 books, including Our Renewable Future, Afterburn, Snake Oil, the end of growth, and many others. He has delivered hundreds of lectures on energy and climate issues in 14 countries and has addressed policymakers from city councils to the European Parliament. He has written for many publications, including Nature, Reuters, Time, the Associated Press, and others, and has appeared in many TV and film documentaries, including Leonardo DiCaprio's 11th Hour. He is the recipient of the M. King Hubert Award for Excellence in Energy Education. So welcome, Richard. Well, thank you, Georgia. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's very kind of you to, to set this up. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to talk about my book. It's just coming out next Tuesday. So this is, is really the first book event that um, I've, I've done so far with this, this particular book. And thank you all for, for showing up. It's a beautiful day outside in Northern California after we got a little taste of rain last night. So thanks for being willing to uh, be indoors in front of a computer for, for an hour or so. I'm going to uh, share my screen and that's, uh, is that showing up well for everyone there? It is for me. Everyone Good. Else. Good. Okay. Well, <clears throat> this is the uh, the cover of the book, and um, it's really, I would say, the culmination of my whole career as a writer and and researcher. Uh, it's a big book. It's about four hundred pages, and uh, and I've and it's a it's a big picture book, um, which is sort of they're not as popular as they used to be, <laughs> but that's another story getting, uh, you know, dealing with publishers and all, all of that in the publishing industry. But this was a book that I, I felt needed to be written in, uh, you know, whether, whether it was going to be difficult to uh, get it published or not. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful to new society for uh, publishers for, uh, for taking it on. Uh, the objective with the book itself and with this presentation is, um, I, I would say, understanding and wisdom. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to suggest a, uh, a, a, a gee whiz cure-all for, for the world's uh, ills, but uh, I, you know, maybe it's just my stage in life. I'm finding that uh, developing wisdom and perspective is uh, is maybe more important than ever. And I, I define wisdom as prior, prioritizing what's truly important from a long range perspective and living well within limits. I came to the book um, as a result of asking myself three uh, three questions. One, how is it that we, just one species out of millions, have become so, so powerful as to bring the planet to the brink of um, climate chaos and a mass extinction event? That's, that's a lot of power for just one species. Second question, why have we developed so, ma so many ways of oppressing and exploiting one another? And third question, is it possible to change our relationship with power 
so as to avert ecological catastrophe while also reducing social inequality and hence the likelihood of some kind of political economic collapse. Now, to me, these, these are the questions and they've been gnawing at me in, in one form or another for my whole adult life, but I, I found they were really kind of coalescing in, into a form that could be expressed in a really concise way. So it, that's, that's what led to this book. So what is power? Well, um, power as an English word really is, covers a lot of territory. It's less true in some other languages such as French and German and others, but in English, power refers to a lot of different things actually. Uh, the rate of energy transfer. If you're a physicist, that's how you define power. Um, the ability to do something. Well, we use energy to do things. So um, you name it, it takes energy to do it. And so we speak of the ability to fly or the power of flight, the power of speech. Then there's social power. Uh, again, other languages have a often have a different word for this kind of power, but in English, it's, we've, all, we've jumbled them all together. And I, I think it's in some ways a good thing. In some ways it's a confusing thing, but for the purposes of this book, I, I found it actually useful. And I'll explain that a little bit more. Social power is the ability to get someone else to do something. If uh, power is the ability to manage energy in order to do something, Social power is the ability to manage other people's energy to do something. And so there are different kinds of social power. There's horizontal social power, which is uh, organized, uh, spontaneously self-organizing groups of people getting together to do things. And then there's vertical social power in which some people tell other people what to do uh, by way of incentives and threats. And then there are other, other ways that we use the, the word power. We talk about the power of ideas, inspiration, force of personality, sexual attraction, love. All of these kinds of power are important. And I, I address them to one degree or another all in, in the book. So the first meaning of power, energy transfer. Well, energy is essential to everything. If you wanna understand basically any ecosystem, any human society, follow the energy, uh, which is really a matter of following the power. And the first, the first chapter of the book, I devote to a discussion of power in nature. And it's a, a thread that ties together all kinds of different subjects from astrophysics to cell biology. Um, this <clears throat> book cover here, uh, Nick Lane, Power, Sex and Suicide. I'm gonna show a few book covers here because I read uh, this writing this book was an excuse to bring myself up to date in a lot of different areas that I've had interest in over the years from uh, um, evolution and cell biology all the way through anthropology and um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll, I'll, I'll be mentioning some books that I thought were really useful and inspiring. This was one. Uh, big book that talks about uh, recent advances in uh, our understanding of how, how life works. Um, this is a little factoid I got from that book. Um, gram for gram, the average organism is 10,000 10, times as powerful as the sun. That sounds nonsensical until you start to do the math. Uh, the fact is the sun is hugely massive. So you divide luminosity by mass and you get, you know, 0 0.0002 milliwatts of power per gram. Well, you do the same thing with just about any organism on the planet. And you see that, you know, we're, we're uh, many uh, hundreds, thousands of times as powerful as the sun on a gram per gram basis. So of course, all of that power is ultimately coming from the sun. It's not, you know, the sun is creating its own power. We're getting it from eating plants, which get it from uh, energy from sunlight and so on. But nevertheless, life is pretty damn amazing. Evolution works by what's called the, the maximum power 
principle, biologists starting in the 1920s realized that uh, individual creatures and species um, succeed by maximizing their, uh, their power throughput to do uh, useful things for you know, getting food and reproducing for, for the most part. And so the maximum power principle is useful for understanding the evolution of all kinds of, of different traits in, in species. You might say, well, if, if the maximum power principle is true, then shouldn't there just be one species that has maximized uh, its rate of energy transfer and outcompeted everything else? Well, the fact is nature is complicated. There are lots of ways of exerting power and lots of different environments in which to do it. And different organisms specialize in those environments in, and in those particular abilities. And the result is you know, just this incredible variety in, uh, in nature. When we talk about the power of, of beauty, it's, it's, this is really something that um, struck me as, as I was doing research for the book. And here's another uh, resource that I uh, stumbled onto, a book called The Evolution of Beauty by uh, Yale, a Yale University ornithologist, Richard Prum. Um, he talks about uh, sexual selection in, in evolution in, in nature, which goes all the way back to uh, Darwin. Uh, organisms, particularly uh, higher animals and plants, flowering plants, develop the ability to at attract mates as a part of their process of survival. So that attraction takes an aesthetic form. And uh, there are lots of examples of this throughout nature. Um, everything from flowers to the you know, colors and songs of birds on and on and on. But often beauty, the production and appreciation of beauty ends up becoming a goal in and of itself, even beyond its usefulness in reproduction. So birds end up enjoying singing even, uh, even when it's not mating season. That the result of all of this is the realization that nature is intentionally beautiful. I mean, we, we subjectively experience nature as being very beautiful, but it's not an accident. Nature is working very hard to produce beauty all the time. Um, chapter two of the book is about the evolution of human power. And of course, this goes back tens and even hundreds of thousands of years to our harnessing of fire, our use of tools, not just stone tools, but you know, wood and, and, um, and more uh, less durable materials that, that our, our ancestors used, clothing and especially language. Um, these things set us apart from um, other organisms. Uh, you know, there, there, you can find examples of other organisms using tools. Um, some crows do it. Uh, and other animals are very avid communicators. But human language with its abstract symbols that can be arranged uh, very precisely according to rules of grammar that's, that's really something qualitatively different from what any other organism has, has done. And it, it enables us to do all these other things far more effectively than anybody else. Um, using language, we can teach other people how to use and make and use particular tools. We can share these things from generation to generation uh, over space and time. Chapter three is about the evolution of vertical social power. Up to this, up to you know, six, seven thousand years ago, really, um, most human societies subsisted by hunting and gathering or simple horticulture, maybe complex horticulture. Um, and there's very little uh, difference in power among people within a, a given society. Decisions were generally made by consensus. Uh, prestige uh, was generally conferred on the basis of 
uh, individual accomplishment or, or knowledge or skill or something like that. But over time, uh, population pressure and uh, competition warfare between human societies led to a situation where it became advantageous to develop grain agriculture. Um, this was not a way of avoiding work. It actually entailed more work, but its one advantage was that more people could be supported in a given land area. Um, and uh, it really changed everything. This, this is an excellent book on that subject, uh, again, by a Yale uh, anthropologist historian. Um, and with grain agriculture came the first uh, cities, kings, uh, all early state societies were slave societies. The, the uh, status of women in society plummeted because cities were very unhealthy places. They constantly had to have an input of new people. So women were, were encouraged or forced to have as many children as they possibly could so as to maintain the, the population of cities. And we've, you know, we've been basically recovering or trying to recover from this, uh, this social innovation ever since. <laughs> um, money, weapons, and communication technologies and social complexity were really the key innovations that, that enabled uh, uh, vertical social power to, um, to come into being and to maintain itself uh, ever since. So, of course, you know, most economists describe money as just a neutral medium of exchange which is ridiculous because we all know from our own experience that money is social power. If you have a lot of money, you can get other people to do things, which is the definition of, of social power. Same thing with weapons and communication technologies going all the way back to writing now have evolved to the point of you know, giant social media companies and disinformation platforms and all the rest. Now, when we developed complex societies, civilizations, uh, we, there were some advantages, especially for the privileged few and a lot of disadvantages. One of the disadvantages was that these ways of living were inherently um, vulnerable to cycles of growth and, and collapse. One of the things that happens is uh, complex societies have what, what some people call a wealth pump. In other words, people who already have an advantage in terms of wealth and social power tend to use that advantage to write the rules in such a way that even more social power will flow to them over time. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Uh, but if that goes on for long enough, then the, the whole system lose its, loses its legitimacy in the eyes of the people who have to participate in it. And, uh, and there get to, comes, come to be more and more uh, people competing with one another to be part of that privileged elite class. And the whole thing tends to come apart. And this Peter Turchin has done you know, really excellent work. He's, he's an ecologist, uh, insect ecologist, who went on to do, has gone on to do just amazing work in human social evolution, uh, showing how this, this process works. So all of this, this goes on uh, you know, since the origin of, of state societies, then empires and so on, um, until a couple of hundred years ago when you know, really all hell breaks loose. Uh, as a result of private ownership of natural resources, government protection for investors, incentives for innovation, it became pos socially possible to start uh, extracting and using fossil fuels. Now this almost happened in China about a thousand years ago. All the ingredients were present. China had a lot of coal, privatization was going on, uh, more and more investment, innovation, lots of, uh, of, of new inventions. There was an incipient industrial revolution happening, but the government shut it down because they saw it as a threat to their existing power structure. Well, that didn't happen in England uh, 
800 years later. So when we get, when we get to the, the uh, 17th and 18th century in Britain and then Europe and, and North America, we see the, the beginnings of industrial society harvesting fossil fuels at ever greater rates and using them to power just about everything. Fossil fuels changed the world profoundly. This is what agriculture looked like before fossil fuels. This is what agriculture looks like after fossil fuels. Um, before fossil fuels, it took 70, 80% of the population working at agriculture in order to grow the food for uh, the minority who lived in, in towns and worked at other occupations. Now it takes one or 2% of the population to grow enough food for everybody else. So the growth of employment and the middle class, which we take for granted as features of modern living is really all down to fossil fuels. Here's a little graph I got from the USDA website, farm jobs as a total of US jobs. Well, <clears throat> I mean, in 1800 or 1780, which is when this graph goes back to, how many people, how many people actually had farm jobs, very few. There were slaves and there were landowners and there were, and there were people who just owned a little bit of land and, and worked it on their own. There were very few people who had jobs in our current sense working on, on farms. But now, you know, we take employment as uh, for granted as, you know, everybody's got to have a job, more jobs. That's a good thing. Uh, it's it, society is just organized in a completely different way. And all of this, again, is down to fossil fuels and energy. Uh, this is global primary energy consumption and, and or usage of consumption is really a misleading term. Uh, but you can see in you know, all of that growth really has come from coal, oil, natural gas. Uh, the other categories are, you know, just tiny little additions. We're still using as much firewood as we were in 1800 or, or even more, but uh, fossil fuels have, have added on the back of that. And they have enabled economic growth, which everyone thinks of as a good thing. Economic growth yields more jobs, more uh, returns on investment, uh, more tax revenues for governments so the governments can do more for us. What's not to like? Um, why are we not taught in school that uh, exponential growth implies a doubling time? At 1% annual growth, any quantity doubles in about 70 years. At 2% growth in 35 years and so on. So this has practical consequences. Just in the last 25 years, the global economy has doubled in size. Okay, so that means that just since 1995, we've used about half the non-renewable resources ever extracted in all of human history. And we want more growth so we can do that again. Population has also been growing. As of uh, September, 2021, we've achieved about 7.9 billion. So population has grown eightfold since the start of the industrial revolution and per capita consumption has also grown eightfold. It's a miracle. There's been nothing like it in all of human history. So we've applied the, all of this fossil fuel, among other things, to the process of production, manufacturing. Uh, but that led to the problem of overproduction and underemployment. That was what largely what the, the uh, Great Depression was all about in the 1930s. That was a huge problem. And we solved it with the creation of consumerism, which is not just a you know, psychological malady affecting some people who, who like to you know, buy a lot on, on amazon.com. It's it, consumerism is rightly understood as a, an economic system. It's a strategy for constantly expanding the market economy. As a result of consumerism, the economy for the first time became a thing to be measured by way of GDP, uh, unemployment rates, and so on. And growth became 
the overwhelming constant goal. Well, growth in, um, in, in the economy, we, we prize, but a lot of other things have grown at the same time, like greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, our, our takeover of wild nature so, uh, you know, other creatures have gone away. 70% of insects are gone. About two thirds of, of vertebrates gone. Uh, we're depleting Earth's resources, minerals, uh, fresh water, um, topsoil, and we're filling up waste sinks, air, soil, water, uh, the atmosphere with carbon emissions. Also, inequality has grown. Now we have about seven individuals who control as much wealth as the poorer half of humanity. And we've developed weapons capable of destroying basically the entire world, world certainly all of, of human society. Isn't that great? <laughs> we've, we've certainly succeeded. Now, it, we've known in principle since 1972 that uh, constant growth is something you can't keep up and that it, it's, it's, uh, it has uh, some real downsides. Uh, when this book came out, I was 21 years old. I read it back in 1972 and it changed my life. Um, I, you know, if anybody hasn't read it, it's still a very important read. Um, and, and several more recent studies have shown that we're right on track for the, the standard run scenario of peaks in population, industrial production, food production per capita um, over the course of you know, the first decades of this century. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this because I'm, I'm not going quite as fast as I'd hoped to. Uh, climate change, a problem of power. Now, we're encouraged to think of climate change as a technical problem of greenhouse gas emissions, which we can solve with renewable energy and carbon sucking machines. But I would, I would suggest that it's, it's not so simple that unless we confront, the, the, and confront power in a larger sense, we're not gonna be able to deal with climate change. How so? I'm not just talking about the power of the fossil fuel industry, the political power of the oil companies. Yes, true, but it's more than that. A lot of it has to do with the characteristics of, of all of the, the available substitutes for fossil fuels. As much as I hate fossil fuels, the fact is they, they have some characteristics that are gonna be hard to replace. Uh, renewable energy sources are subject to intermittency, which is going to require energy storage, whether batteries or something else. Uh, source redundancy, we're going to have to build a lot more uh, solar panels and uh, wind turbines than we'll need on a good sunny, windy day, because not all days are going to be sunny and windy, and we're going to have to place them all over the place so we can join them up together via super grids to cancel out those days when we don't have enough. All of that is gonna take an enormous amount of infrastructure. Then there's the 20% conundrum. Uh, solar and wind produce electricity, which is great. Electricity is a very versatile energy form, but we only use 20% of our energy currently in the form of electricity. That other 80% is gonna to have to be electrified or we're going to have to use electricity to produce synthetic fuels, hydrogen and methanol and other things, all of that is going to introduce new inefficiencies into, into the system. So I, I, I worked with uh, a colleague, David Fridley of the uh, energy analysis team at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory a couple of years ago to, to, we spent a year looking at this problem and resulted in the book, Our Renewable Future, which is you can download online for free at ourrenewablefuture.org. And our conclusion was, you know, if we try to replace all this energy infrastructure quickly over the course of the next 20 years, the result is gonna be a big pulse in carbon emissions because 
producing all of that infrastructure is going to take an enormous amount of energy. And right now, 80% of that energy is coming from fossil fuels. So it's the, the only way out is to reduce the amount of energy that we're using pretty substantially in industrial countries so that it's, it, will, it will take less energy and we won't have to build as much, much infrastructure. But that means giving up power. Energy is power by definition. And if people have less energy in their lives, they're going to experience that as giving up power in various ways. We have to get everyone on board for that or it's not going to work out very well. Already, we have a lot of inequality in, in the world, economic inequality. And the, the level of inequality in many countries is growing rapidly, especially the US, but also China and a number of other countries. Um, you can read this for yourself. I'm not, I'm not going to recite it, but that's, that's a pretty substantial uh, factoid from, from Jason Hickel. So inequality in and of itself is going to be a, a huge political and social problem in the next uh, years and decades if we don't deal with it. And the only way to deal with it is for people who currently have the most power, economic and social power, to give up some, to share it with everybody else. And we know from psychological studies and I, I spend a whole section in, in the book talking about the psychology of power, uh, a whole raft of psychological experiments and studies have shown that people who have inordinate power tend, don't like it very much when that power is threatened, and they tend to fight back in, in various ways, and they will deny their own privilege uh, in, in all sorts of ways in order to avoid having to deal with the reality of, of, their, of their power. So though all of this brings up a question, are we even capable of it? Are we capable of power self-limitation? We talked about the maximum power principle earlier. If that's true, if maximizing power is central to our evolution, then maybe evolution has designed us to overshoot natural limits and crash land, taking the rest of the planet with us. That's possible. I, I think it's more complicated than that because when I started looking around, and this is kind of an, uh, I, I think a little bit of a, a, uh, an original contribution of the book. Uh, I call it the optimal power principle because in, throughout nature, we see ways in which nature balances power. They're in homeostasis within individual cells and organisms, balancing mechanisms within ecosystems. Human beings have learned to do the same thing. In indigenous societies had limits to uh, the, the social power of individuals within groups, uh, and also limits to the harvesting of natural resources. And these, these uh, traditions were hard won because when human beings first arrived in new environments, what they typically did was kill off the, the, the megafauna to the point of extinction. And it was only over time that they learned and developed these taboos to preserve what was left. So this is wisdom. This is cultural wisdom. We, we still have ways of doing that today. How do we self-limit our power in modern society? We keep uh, despots from arising with the use of democracy. We have financial regulations to keep uh, you know, corporations and banks and so on from running amok. We have environmental regulations to prevent uh, various kinds of pollution. We have we tax the wealthy at higher rates. We have government redistributive programs like in this country, social security and Medicare and so on. We have arms treaties to keep from, you know, having a nuclear war and, and so on. So if we can limit power, why aren't we doing it? Why do we still have climate change? Why are we at this, this precipice? Well, it's, it, we're in a, a unique historical moment where you know, after 200 years of fossil fuels, 
we've gotten used to using energy to solve all our problems. If there's a problem, just throw more energy at it, right? And we believe we're, and we're constantly told that there are no limits. Human beings are capable of inventing new technologies to solve any and every problem. We don't have to give up growth. We don't have to give up power because there's always going to be more. And if there is a problem, well, we can solve it with more economic growth. Um, in the book, I, I point to other you know, psychological characteristics that, that uh, are leading us to you know, discount the future and, and so on. But I, I think really just the, the impact of fossil fuels has been the main thing that has led us to you know, take, the, take the reins off so that we're, we're no longer limiting ourselves the way we used to. It, it, in traditional societies, parents teach their children the importance of thrift and sharing. And now, why bother? You know, we want to teach our kids to compete for the top positions uh, and, and so on and so on. So what is, what's the future look like? Uh, under these circumstances? Well, uh, in the seventh and last chapter of the book, I suggest there's a, there's a spectrum of possibilities from collective self-annihilation uh, at one extreme to sufficient self-restraint at the other. I don't think there's a likely future in which we just continue growing and, and elaborating technological innovation and disrupting markets and so on and achieving more and more without having to confront um, the limits that we've, we've been avoiding for so long. Our current path is one that I think is going to lead us to a, a sort of all against all crisis, where with increasing inequality, there will be increasing erosion of trust, environmental breakdown, leading to food system crises, mass migrations, and failure of governments, even in currently rich countries. And I think we're we're seeing all of these things play out right now, certainly in, in this country. What, what do we have to self-limit? All these things, you know, population, resource extraction, waste dumping, energy usage, land use, inequality, armaments. Uh, and a lot of good people are working in all of these fields. Um, ultimately, I think if we are successful in limiting ourselves, in, in voluntary ways, we could, we could find the production, protection, and appreciation of beauty, a new uh, aim, a new goal for human, um, human life on this planet. You know, uh, if, if you have had the experience, uh, as, as I have in, in my life, of devoting your, your, your time to the arts and uh, or to spirituality or martial arts or something like that, you know, these are, these are ways of, of, um, te of training our own capacities, our own physical capacities to produce beauty, ways of engaging the whole brain and that, um, you know, transcend a lot of the, the uh, selfishness and um, disunity that, that, that we're accustomed to, self-control as a pathway to happiness and inner power is a possible future for our species. But if we're going to get there, we're going to have to fight vertical power with horizontal power in various ways. Now, will this happen? I don't know. I mean, this is why, to me, this is more about wisdom and perspective than anything else, because a lot of us have been saying for a long time, we need for a grand alliance to arise between you know, people who are into ecosystem protection, indigenous rights, uh, equality, economic equity, uh, anti-war. All of these folks are pulling in the right direction, but we all have gotten siloed and the way uh, the nonprofit world works and the way the, the foundation world works tend to reinforce these silos that keep us all working in, 
in in often at cross purposes with one another, competing for the few available sources of funding and so on. We've got to get beyond that, build community resilience and build trust by living with wisdom, integrity, courage, and compassion. That's, again, is that gonna happen? Well, we can make it happen for ourselves. We can make it happen in our, in our closest personal relationships. We can make it happen in our communities and maybe we can happen, make it happen in the world, but it's gotta start somewhere. So there it is. Um, I, I mentioned uh, limits to growth as one of my guiding lights in terms of literature. The other one is uh, is the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu. I've been reading it since I was 20 years old too. Um, mastering others is strength. Mastering yourself is true power. So that's the book. And uh, there's a lot more to it than I can cover in half an hour or so. So um, please check it out. And um, maybe we can entertain some uh, some discussion now. Yes, now we're gonna to go to um, Q&A. But first, before we do that, I know Philip has had his hand up, so you're gonna be first. Um, but I wanted to ask you just before we get into the Q&A with the audience is, one of the things that happened during World War II that really helped make our, uh, the Allies a success was rationing. Right. And people were on board with it. I know it was a different time. People were less selfish. We didn't have as many libertarians, but uh, yes, this, this is <laughs> any way you slice it. Okay. <laughs> How possible do you think it would be to introduce some form of rationing, maybe starting voluntarily, but working um, politically to right. get this in the consciousness and then into reality? How, how possible do you think that is? Well, when, when we get to the point of real scarcity, then I think uh, that we are more likely to see calls for rationing or rationing. Uh, I'm a big fan of it also, uh, but it, it really only works if you have popular buy-in and it usually takes some kind of crisis situation to create that. And this, this is the, the book on the subject. So if you're interested in learning more about rationing, Stan Cox anyway, is, is, the, uh, is the way, is the expert. Okay, uh, and, the, and energy rationing, there's a, there's a, a, a program that was tried out in, in Britain. It hasn't been expanded, but um, tradable energy quotas is uh, what it's called, or TEQ, the TEX. Uh, so Google that and read up on it. And it's also in Wikipedia. It's, it's a really interesting program. Okay, I'm just putting that in the chat box. Uh, Philip, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I would. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, first off, Richard, you have written a, a marvelous book. I, I guess I'm probably the only one in the current discussion group to have read it because I got it in advance of its uh, hitting the bookstores. But uh, so <laughs> nobody else can disagree with me because I know some stuff you don't yet. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I was powerfully affected by it. I think it's really no pun intended with that. Um, it does a marvelous job of putting things in context, uh, important things, important questions, looking at them from the point of view of uh, historical cellular development, you know, stuff that I don't know anything about and am uh, overjoyed to be learning about. I'm going to go back and read the book a second time just to uh, re reinforce my what, I, what I've learned from it. Um, so Congratulations on that, and I wish you uh, the greatest possible success in uh, appealing to a broad swath of, of the reading public. And I think you, I think you will. It's so well written. You know, this, it's just marvelous. Uh, it was, it was fun to read, even though I was trying to read it really quickly. Um, <laughs> That's and, so great to hear, Philip. Thank you. And I think you've you've uh, created a wonderful further contribution to the hoped for success, the hoped for uh, survival of the species. <laughs> there was one thing that I didn't find that I had hoped to find, mm. and I'm wondering about why it's not there. And that is an appreciation and a uh, discussion of the 
uh, importance of public banking. You oh. certainly do a good job talking about the uh, the failure of capitalism to provide for a sustainable future. But when it comes to uh, looking at tools to be developed in order to uh, get out of the get out from underneath the heel of a rampant capitalism, um, there I, I would have liked a little more detail. And in particular, I would like to see uh, an appreciation and validation of the concept of public banking. Uh, and Georgia was just pointing out to us that uh, we're making progress in that direction. Uh, AB 1147 is the, the bill that uh, all we need is for Newsom to stay in, in power and to sign the bill, and we will have uh, a new panoply of not exactly public banks, but principles that uh, are at the basis of the, the need for, uh, for public banking, including uh, uh, greater, greater equity for, uh, you know, greater e equality for uh, underserved uh, uh, segments of the public. And anyway, we're, the, 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 the movement is real and it's uh, having several successes in spite of all kinds of uh, hurdles that it has to clear. I'm and going to I want ask to know, you to, to wrap it up, Philip. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to find out how come you don't say anything <laughs> explicit about public banking in your book, and um, how, and how do you feel about the the institution in in general? Well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mention it. Uh, I'm certainly aware of it, and I wrote about it in a previous book, The End of Growth, which was published in 2011. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I uh, that was probably a uh, a missed opportunity to to include discussion in the new book as well. But uh, sorry, it's not there. Covered a lot of other things in the new book. <laughs> but, like. but it's not. But it's not because you don't think that public banking is a oh, good no. idea. Oh no, no. I, I certainly think it's a good idea. Uh -huh. Good. Do we have? Uh, looks like uh, Rocky. Thank you, Richard. Uh, it's Rocky Stone. Good to hear you speak again. I, I just wanted to say, look, you've done a wonderful job of, of explaining history and, and how things change. Uh, and, and really, if we look back at the uh, very briefly, the, the last 8,100 years, we can see that agriculture for the last 8,000 uh, before this present 100 really remains the same. It's, uh, you know, 90% of the people uh, are working on the land and, and uh, it is controlled by a, a small number at the top. And then the, the last hundred years that we've lived through have seen the uh, number of people that worked on the land dropping down to 2%. Uh, we, we could see that instead of worrying about not being able to produce enough and people starving, as Malthus told us about in the late 18th century, we now see that the problem is we're we're having population growth at an astounding rate. And the one thing that stayed the same is we still have a, a hierarchy where the, this, uh, the agricultural system is dominated by a very small group. Right. And thank you for the opportunity, Georgia. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, this is a, a feature of just about all agricultural societies because grains are storable and therefore taxable they allowed for the arisal of a managerial class, uh, powerful people, kings. And we've been with that, we've had that as a, a feature, not necessarily kings per se, but uh, social inequality has been a feature ever since the adoption of agriculture. I really think the, the permaculture folks have got it right. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, be acquainted with uh, David Holmgren, who's one of the founders of, of permaculture. And I've had some discussions with him about this. Um, he, they, they understood back in the 1970s, not only that we would be facing a crisis with the depletion of fossil fuels and climate change and, also, and so on, but they also had some anthropological understanding. And they, they saw that uh, agriculture has really been bad for us in a social sense as well. So the idea of returning to gardening as opposed to field agriculture as a way of subsistence 
you know, just has implications all across the board for making the world uh, and human experience a, a, a lot better. So I, I could say more about that, but I just uh, just to say there, you know, permaculture is not just a, a cool way of gardening. There's a lot more to it. It's a, it's a whole philosophy. I think that's very interesting to look into. And I realized this year, this summer, probably for the first time, all the produce that I've been buying or or receiving from friends or trading has been grown in Sonoma or Sonoma Valley. Hmm. All the produce, which is cool. pretty wonderful actually to know that we can supply all our food needs here. Um, Julie, I think you have a question. You need to unmute, Julie. There, is that good? Thank yes. you so much for this wonderful presentation. And I especially like the focus on beauty because if you just stop and look, the sky, the trees, everything, so beautiful. And one of my personal things is to create as much beauty in my life as possible. And the core contrast to that is there is a special on PBS called Plastic Wars. It's on Frontline. And it is so horrifying to see bales and bales of plastics that can't be recycled and so forth. And if people could only see the ugliness of deforestation, strip mining, extractive industries, oil spills, it might be a big wake up call that we really need to preserve what is good and beautiful about our planet. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that comment. In the book, I talk about aesthetic decadence which is where the, the competition for uh, creation of, of beauty and appreciation of beauty gets out of hand. And like the Irish elk created these, ended up creating these huge antlers that were so big and so heavy that it led to the extinction of the animal. So our, our instinct for the creation of beauty can get hijacked. And I think that's what's happened with, with capitalism, basically. Our, our instinct for the creation and appreciation of beauty gets hijacked when, when it, that process becomes commercialized. So, and I'm not just talking about TV commercials per se, but the whole, the whole arts industry is driven so much by in, money and, and, and inevitably so, because that's the society we live in. And idealistic young creative people end up getting their <laughs> you know, their creative impulses shaped and warped uh, by, by, by the commercial milieu in which they, they have to develop. Um, what could we do if, if it weren't that way? Thank you. Yeah. Probably be a lot more art. Okay, yeah. Linda and then Jerry. Linda? There we go. So Richard, great presentation. In fact, I was in Santa Rosa when I first woke up to climate change because of your movie. What was it? The Oh, um, End of Suburbia. Yeah, cool. Totally changed my life when I saw that. Um, so what do you feel is going to happen? I mean, the IPC, the I, what is it, the IPPCA came out with code red. I mean, what is going to change the power dynamics enough? Are we going to have to hit bottom? Are we going to have to have a revolution? I mean, government is not control, controlling the fossil fuel industry. And until we stop putting carbon in the air, we're going down. So yeah. I don't see the ending of the power problem that we have that you're raising. I just, I don't see the solution unless there's some kind of revolution or something's got to give. What, what do you feel is going to happen? Yeah, well, I, you know, there are too many variables at play to try to predict uh, you know, a sequence of events. But as you say, you know, the governments don't want to give up fossil fuels because that's the fundamental source of power, because it, that's, that's what creates economic growth and we come to rely on it and that's what keeps governments going. So even if they're willing to, you know, throw a, a, a few pennies here and there at renewable energy or carbon capture or this or that, the fact of the matter is that uh, we're going to, continue relying on fossil fuels until that becomes no longer tenable as a result of, you know, depletion. So we're, we're in for a, a really rough ride, I think, over the course of this century. 
and you say, well, a revolution, what's, what's it got to come from? Well, it, as, as I talked about earlier, it's not going to be just the you know, environmentalists getting out in street uh, extinction rebellion is a good example. And that they raised some hell in, over in, in Britain and, and Europe, not so much here in this country. But I think it's going to take a, a coalition of all of the, basically a, an anti-collapse coalition <laughs> of everyone who is, is, is aware of these power imbalances that take so many forms and is willing to work together to rebalance our relationships with nature and one another. That's what it's going to take. Will it happen? I don't know, but that's, you know, that's what I'm devoting my life to. So. I like that idea, anti-collapse coalition. <laughs> that could be the name of the new group. Um, I'm gonna call on Jerry next. I, I just wanna bring up something though. I remember in the mid nineties, reading in the New York Times on a whole energy section that Chevron had already planned out because at that time we were thinking we're really gonna be going back, uh, not using so much fossil fuel. And here they were planning the next 40 years of extraction. Mm -hmm. sure. And I thought that goes into 2030. That's serious. And here we are still on that trajectory, I believe. So, right. yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, this decade, the 2020s, we're going to see uh, all fossil fuels start to decline for, for different reasons. Coal, world coal extraction is, has probably already hit its maximum. It's starting to decline. Uh, world oil production hit a peak in November 2018, and it's, it's been going downhill ever since. I could go into much more detail about all this because this is, this is one of my special areas of study. But you know, even if we decide, if we even if we don't decide to do something about climate change, the reality is fossil fuels are not a sustainable way of, uh, of you know supporting an economy. So uh, we're, we're you know <laughs> we we've got to think of a plan B fast. Right. Okay, Jerry, you're next. And then Laurie. Um, so Richard, I've been working in the trenches as a lawyer and a member of the uh, Sierra Club State Committee on Climate and Energy to try and introduce your perspective. Uh, and in my mind, in contrast to people like Mark Jacobson and Jeremy Rifkin and others, uh, and you know, I have all sorts of practical questions I'd love to ask you, yeah. but one that I'll limit myself to here, um, Mark Jacobson, in response to what you were saying about the need for using more fossil fuels to create the infrastructure for renewables, one of his answers is that electrification, the uh, energy efficiency of electrification reduces energy use by 57%. Right. And I'm sure you've seen that. Sure. So what's your response to that? Well, it's true. You know, we, the way we use uh, fossil fuels to generate electricity, this is also true of, of nuclear power, but let's focus on fossil fuels, is extremely inefficient. Um, a coal power plant may, may uh, yield only 40% of the energy that's present in the coal as energy in the form of electricity. So by going to direct electricity production via solar and wind, you're, you have a big efficiency boost. But the problem is dealing with the intermittency of solar and wind is going to introduce all sorts of new inefficiencies in, the, in forms of the need for energy storage, like uh, batteries, pumping water uphill, so you can uh, regain the energy when it's pumped back downhill or and whatever, however you store energy, it's going to be inefficient. Energy storage is inherently inefficient and some battery storage happens to be particularly inefficient then um, not everything is going to be easy to electrify. So we're going to need um, a way of making synthetic fuels using hydrogen, combine, maybe combining hydrogen with carbon taken from the atmosphere to make methanol or you know, whatever. 
if we're going to do that at scale for you know industrial high heat applications for aviation for shipping for for large scale trucking because all of those things are going to be really hard to electrify that means we're going to need an industry roughly the size of today's oil industry devoted to making synthetics which is a very energy inefficient process just making hydrogen is very energy inefficient. So yes, you get some efficiency boost at one end, but then you create new inefficiencies on the other end. And you know, I have nobody is it can really do all of the math right now because there are too many variables. But my guess is it it's pretty much a wash that you know the the, the energy transition is going to take an enormous amount of energy, however you slice it. So if I could just briefly follow up. So basically, redo, you know, drawing down the economy is really the only answer. Yeah. I mean, in combination with electrification and renewables and all that. And w w one other quick question. People like Jeremy Rifkin and, and Jason as well, they're talking about this vast grid that's going to be created as a response to, to the uh, problems of intermittency. So mm -hmm. that energy can be sort of moved around magically across huge you know, uh, distances. How real is that? Well, it, it, it's an infrastructure. I mean, already our electricity grid is the biggest machine humans ever have ever created. We're talking about making that machine you know, two, three times as big. So it's, it's a huge job. I mean, the, the, the uh, Biden infrastructure plan doesn't even touch the stuff that we're talking about. So we're talking about tens of trillions of dollars required in, in investment. And, and th this kind of you know, big grid would, or something like it would be needed for seasonal intermittency. You know, diurnal inter intermittency over 24 hours, you can solve that with batteries. And I've lived with, you know, solar photovoltaics and batteries for over 20 years. I, I, I kind of know how it works on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, you know, if the sun isn't shining on a particular day, you can ride it out with batteries or maybe two days or three days. But over the course of a year, you know, you know that February is not going to be like June. So how do you make up for seasonal intermittency? You're not going to do it with batteries. So you have to do something else. And that's why the, the folks who are planning for a renewable future are talking about, you know, the super grid and, and source redundancy and so on. And it's hard to imagine how we could do it without something along those lines. I, I was just thinking, listening to you, that it would be a very interesting dialogue for you and Mark Jacobson to be Yes, <laughs> with, with that. <laughs> for years, Georgia. I thought that would be. I think that would be a really. If Mark would agree to it, I mean, he. It wouldn't be a debate like with Stuart Brand. He did a debate with Stuart Brand, which um, he he got so much information um, piled into a short amount of time. But I think this would be a dialogue, not not so much a debate. And I I think mm -hmm. it would be really interesting. I, I, I can see if Mark would be interested. Do you know him personally, Richard? I, I don't. Um, I think he probably knows who I am. I'm sure um, he would. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't like the debate format. No, it wouldn't but, be a debate. But, That's why I called it a dialogue. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think he's probably a, you know, a, a, a very uh, approachable person, and, and it would be interesting to get to know him. I think most of what he says we would probably agree with. Uh, and there are those areas where you're bringing up that I don't think he's really looked at seriously yet. That's my my take. Um, I, I think I think he has a a conclusion that he arrived at before he started his work, and his, all of his work is a way of justifying that conclusion. Well, I've That's, seen some changes in his thinking, though, and just I think Jerry, what the paper that not the paper, but the interview you sent today to mm -hmm. me. Uh, shows some changes from when we've no, talked to him before. His basic, his basic approach really hasn't changed. Um, yeah. That would be a fascinating, uh, boy, I, I would pay double 
Well, I, I would ask for twice as big a, uh, a, a yeah, right. intervention too. Well, this is going to be a big deal. Uh, but, you know, I'll see. I'll, you know, we had him speak for an event. Uh-huh, good. He, he did. He spoke at our conference that when you played music and spoke at that one in 2014. And he came to Sonoma and gave a talk. Yeah. So uh, I can see if he'd be interested. I think it would be, I, I call it a dialogue. I don't want to debate either. I, I really think a dialogue would be great to just bring these ideas out into the open. Mm -hmm. So I know, Laura, you've got your hand up. Lori, where did you go? Oh, Lori is muted. Lori, you're muted. Yeah, I, I got it. My space bar wasn't working. Any, anyway, I just wanted to say um, so many things have been talked about that I had in a question for you. But my end, end result is this, is buy-in. Um, you see the difficulty we have right now with the president going ahead and dictating um, hopefully that that people will you know be vaccinated okay right. it's going to be the same deal where there's going to be the pros and cons of why do you do this and why don't you do it and it's you know you're taking away my freedom and and things of that nature so um there's also got to be an institute or some some think tank that is working on this that you know, we'll have almost a 20 year span before we may see any results of some of their activities. Um, any of these two things you think are happening or have a good chance of happening? Yeah, well, you're pointing to a, 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 one of the real problems I see right now, which is uh, the, the decline of so social cohesion in this country, in Brazil, a number of countries around the world, we're at a moment in time where if we're going to survive, we can only do it by limiting power in various forms. And people who currently have power or aspire to having power don't want to hear that. And they're going to see the people calling for power limitation as the enemy. And we're already politically polarized. This, I, and I think actually a lot of that polarization is down to exactly what we're talking about because the folks on, on the right end of the political spectrum, you know, I, I used to think that conservatism had something to do with conserving nature or culture or good things like that. But after years of study, um, I, I've come to a different conclusion that conservatism, at least as it's commonly practiced is about conserving current power inequalities. That's what it's really about. Um, and, it's, that's cool. <laughs> and as long as that's the case, you know, it's going to, it's going to be a, a, a battle. Uh, but social cohesion is the most important asset going forward. The, the societies that have high levels of buy-in and cohesion are going to do much, much better in, in this uh, historic energy and social transition than the others that are at, at each other's throats. Time to move to Spain. Okay, um, Ned, you're next. Oh, well, thank you. Well, Richard, I join everyone else in, in just tremendous respect for this big picture book. It certainly is that. And it seems that these times are calling out the best from our thinkers and writers in our system that producing with Jeremy Lent was another just tr tremendous thinking coming through. So, you know, you started off with the, the goal of living well within limits. It's, uh, and that's certainly, that's beautiful. And, and beauty came in there too, in an interesting way. I love that. But that goes back to the ecological footprint, which is one of those things came after the limits of growth of how we're just so far beyond the, the means. And so this is another say, yeah, we've got to live within what we've got and we could do it beautifully. So, well, all I can do is just thank you for, I'm really, it, it's a lot to absorb the way you've laid this out is just gorgeous. And all the work you've done to consolidate so many, so much thinking and thought from, 
molecular biology all the way up to the whole planet. It's just, it's fantastic. So thank you. Thank you, Ned. Uh, you know, it's, speaking about living well within limits, I talk in the book uh, to a, a fair degree about death. Um, and of course, death is something we like to deny and avoid uh, talking about and, and thinking about, um, especially in modern Western culture. But death is kind of a, a picture frame around, around uh, life. And unless we come to terms with death in, in a, a really honest and, and creative way, I don't think we can live um, in, in, in a path of wisdom. Uh, Native Americans famously believed that, and I think they were absolutely right. So um, <clears throat> here's, here's for, and maybe, maybe we need also to think about the possibility of human extinction in the same light. You know, if we, if we want to survive as a species, shouldn't we be thinking about acting in a way that deserves to survive? I mean, does, does, uh, does evolution grant survival just uh, to any species just because it wants to survive? Well, of course not, because every species wants to survive. But you have to, you, you have to do certain things. You have to fit in <laughs> you, uh, in order to survive. And, uh, and so we, we need to start thinking along those lines. Along those lines, what do you think of uh, deep adaptation? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a really useful um, discussion that Jim Bendel started, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I know a number of people who are associated with with that. and And it's I think it's a really thoughtful um, contribution. There's also um, dark. It's a little depressing, yeah. But but you know we need to we need to think about all of the you know, the, the the range of possibilities. Uh, there's also a group in Britain called Dark Mountain. If you don't know about them, they have they have a website. And they're, 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 this is more a, a, a group of creative people, writers, and so on, poets, and and they're willing to think about, you know, the 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 more disturbing possibilities. You know, what if we don't make it? What if what if this is the end of the species? Well, what is what does that mean? How to, how to process that? How and that gets you back really to living well within limits, because maybe maybe the limits are really converging in a in a way that uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're going to call you Doctor Doom again. <laughs> uh, do we have any other questions before we? Uh, this has been such a rich. Uh, a, presentation and discussion, Richard, I'm really grateful to you for well, spending time with us and, and the questions that people ask are so good. I, Linda had an, an, an additional question early on oh, that she okay. wasn't able to get in. Is, is, is that question still relevant? Well, I mean, it kind of follows on with what you just mentioned about this dark mountain. I mean, I'm, I'm beginning to see that people are beginning now to talk about how we only have three to five years that, you know, I thought we had like nine years. Well, people are beginning to say, no, we have about three to five years before governments, main governments in the Western world just can't hold it together. So what do we do? I mean, what, what, what do we need to do right now to start preparing for what could be a breakdown of civil society? Mm -hmm. Are there stories that you're aware of? What, 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 what would you say we need to do? Get to know your neighbors and be a trustworthy person. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you're a trustworthy person, then other trustworthy people will want to associate with you. That's what it really comes down to. And, and it, it, probably some of you have had experience with wildfires uh, like, like my wife and I did uh, three years ago here in Santa Rosa. And it was our neighbors who came knocking on our door at 3 a.m. and told us to get out. It wasn't you know the fire department. It wasn't the federal government. Um, so you know, uh, getting to know your neighbors and making really practical, simple preparations to take care of yourself and your, and your loved ones. I think it's, yeah. it's, it's time. Yeah. Regional, regional organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been very, very instructive, interesting. And I think I will, I will try to get that follow-up that I mentioned 
see if we can get that uh, dialogue going. We'll, we'll see. Uh, but anyway, uh, Richard, any final things you want to say to the group before we... No, it's just words of appreciation. This has been, you know, it's it's a, obviously it's a pretty small group, but but uh, but clearly some folks who've already been thinking deeply and persistently about uh, life's important questions, and so it's it's always a pleasure to to converse with uh, fellow travelers. So thank you. Yeah, and we will. I will send you the recording of this event, Richard. So uh, and everyone on this call as well. So thank you everyone, we'll, we will stop recording shortly and you can hang out at the water cooler for a few minutes if you like to. Thanks Richard. Thank you. Looking to.